Hello everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm welcoming you to the se session three of our squint and pediatric ophthalmology. Today we have a. Ma'am, we are not live yet. Yes. You're not live yet. Okay. We tell you when you're live. Yeah. He's here with you. Asha is in a hurry. She's a real life. <laughs> yeah. Hello. hello. I'm Dr. Asha here, and uh, uh, today we'll be speaking on uh, laws of ocular motility, terminologies of ocular movements and fixation and field of fixation. And our speaker is Dr. Sampada Kulkarni. Uh, and the session is being chaired by Dr. Pradeep Sharma and co chaired by Dr. Rohit Saxena. Both are my teachers, and I'm eagerly looking forward to this session. So I'm quickly handing over this to Dr. Pradeep Sharma. He'll be introducing our speaker to us. Thank you, Dr. Asha. So we are now on the third topic of uh, strabismus I focus online. And we have a very young energetic uh, speaker, Dr. Sampada Kulkarni, who is a consultant of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus and neuro-ophthalmology at Children's Eye Care Center, LVPI Hyderabad. And uh, she has had a basic medical education from Maharashtra Institute of Medical Education and Research, Pune, and PG from Shekhar Eye Hospital, Bangalore. So she has a uh, wide range of experience and now she is at, at LVPI. Her main interest as a, is pediatric cataract, simple and complex strabismus and neuro-ophthalmological conditions. But today she is going to talk on a very, very fundamental topic, a, one of the foundations of strabismus and we are all very eager to hear from her, uh, something which we probably read long time ago. <laughs> so, Sampada, please. Uh, yes, I am please. sharing my screen now. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Dr. Amitava has also joined us as the co-chair. Welcome, Amitava. Thank you. Okay, so can we start? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Happy Teacher's Day to all. So the topic given to me is a very, very basic topics in uh, squint and uh, pediatric of that, especially the one who are practicing uh, binocular vision. So the topic is uh, law of ocular motility, terminologies and fixation. So we'll just go on with some basic suspects. I'm trying to cover here. The first aspect is the uh, terminologies of eye movements. Then we will go ahead with law of ocular motilities and then we will just touch upon fixation and field of fixation, what is binocular fixation. So when we are talking about ocular movements and its characteristics, we divide the ocular movements into ductions. Those are monocular eye movements, virgins which are binocular conjugate eye movements, virginses are the disconjugate binocular eye movements. Saccards are actually the refixation eye movement to keep the focus on the fovea and pursuits are the slow tracking movements on the moving objects or a scanning eye movements. So these are the basic terms which are used. I will come back to these definitions again. Uh, just to start the topic, I thought that we'll just introduce uh, to the audience uh, these terms. So when we are talking about adductions, the adductions are like adduction. When the eye, the muscular ductus, the eye is moving towards the nose, we call it as a deduction. When it is moving towards ear, we call it as a b duction, abduction. When it goes up, we call it as sarsum duction. When it goes down, we call it as duo sarsum duction. Uh, when the eye in torts, we call it as in cyclo torsion. That the eye, the twelve o'clock meridian, is moving towards your nose. That is called as in cyclo duction. When the same twelve o'clock meridian is moving outwards, then we call it as ex cyclo duction. So virgins are dextro version. Dextro means towards your right side. When the eyes are moving towards right, we call it as dextro version. When it is moving towards left, it is called as levo version. Uh, same terms which are used for ductions will be used for virgins also, but we call it sarsum version and levo sarsum version. Again, the dextro uh, cyclo version and levo cyclo version. Virgences are actually disconjugate eye movement as I discussed. So when we are talking about virgin, we speak towards conjugate eye movement. If you want to look towards your right side, you move the eyes in the right gaze where the um, basically the lateral rectus of the right eye and medial rectus of the left eye are turning to a particular point of interest. While conversions where the both eyes are disconjugate and they are trying to focus an area of interest closer. If it is closer to you, the eyes will converge inside when the interest is going beyond the convergence point, the eyes need to diverge. They go outside. Um, 
and the same terminology applies for the further if we go forward uh, just to show and reiterate the points what we have discussed so this girl the position which is in the center where both the eyes are focusing on a particular interest in the infinity the eyes are in the primary gaze position where all the muscles are working at the same position when we try to move the eyes in dextro version as we discussed that like the right eye left eye is moving in conjugate movements same happens in levo version when you are elevating the eye the same movements are called as sarsam duction or sarsam version dex, uh, do sarsam version this is dextro elevation this is dextro depression so the muscle which are used here uh, maybe we can discuss at the same time or we can discuss it later also uh, basically um, when you are trying to move the eye in elevation especially in the dextro elevation we have particular muscles here which play a very important role uh, we will come back to this uh, definitions again especially which muscles are working at which position uh, this this particular gaze is called as levo elevation and this is levo depression so there are six cardinal gaze positions and nine gazes which we actually measure our skin squint uh, especially to look for the patterns or incompetence these are the applied aspects of the ocular movements uh, when we come back that's what we discuss now so conversions again because this nine gaze photograph is not showing if the eyes are focusing from this target to this target it has to move inside and this is called as conversions so these are disconjugate movements because there is uh, equal supply to the medial rectus on the each side when the movement of the target is going from closer to distance the eyes need to diverge so the eyes are actually going away from each other but again these are disconjugate movements of the eyes i hope i am clear if you have any doubts at this point uh, please feel free to uh, ask Yes, ma'am. We can take the uh, questions later at the end of the session. We can go ahead. Okay, sure. So uh, now uh, the terminologies of the eye movements. Again, uh, so now we talk about agonist muscles. So what are the agonist muscle? If we go back to the nine gaze photograph, the muscles which uh, the primary muscle where the uh, area of the focus need to be changed that is called as agonist muscle. So if we I want to see in our dextro version or the object on my right eye side, actually my right lateral rectus is focusing there, and the left medial rectus is coming along with that. so these are the agonist muscle or synergistic uh, agonist muscle antagonist muscle is when we are actually seeing in one particular direction the muscle which is has a opposite action so if we are trying to look at dextro version the lat right right lateral rectus is a agonist muscle which is getting innervation to move the eye towards your right side but the right medial rectus has to be inhibited to move the eye smoothly towards that particular direction so it is called as an antagonist muscle so the right medial rectus here will become an antagonist muscle if you want to see in a dextro version position synergistic muscle is the muscle from the contralateral eye which helps the eyes to have a conjugate smooth movement to have a particular direction of the um, and area of the interest to see so the synergistic muscle for dextro version for the right lateral rectus will be the left medial rectus so when you talk about yoke muscle again uh, the yoke muscles are the muscles which help you to move the eyes in a particular direction like if you are seeing the right gaze the right lateral rectus and the left medial rectus are called as a yoke muscle so this is very important fact which happens only in the eyes so if you talk about agonist antagonist synergistic muscles overall body the skeletal muscles will have these agonist antagonist and synergistic muscles but yoke muscles are the paired muscle which only are present in our eyes uh, and that is a very important aspect to keep the binocularity intact to have a binocular single vision when we are having any uh, any change in the position of the uh, area of interest a uh, contralateral antagonist is a muscle uh, so if we are talking again about the dextro version the left lateral rectus will be an antagonist contralateral antagonist for that particular uh, version's movement so now if we go forward again with the example if you see here the agonist muscle if the patient is looking towards left the agonist muscle is left uh, medial rectus 
or the left lateral rectus and the right medial rectus. Antagonist will be the right lateral rectus and the left medial rectus. If the patient is looking on the opposite side, the same becomes opposite of it, like vice versa. So patient is looking at the right side, agonist muscles are the lateral rectus of the right eye and medial rectus of the left eye. And antagonist will be just opposite of it. So getting uh, these terminologies into our discussion now, we'll go ahead with what are the yoke pair muscles. Uh, this is actually very interesting to see because these all things are important when we are talking about uh, inhibitional palsies or paralysis of the any of the muscles or you're talking about restrictive pathologies. Here we have to talk about the yoke muscle and the simultaneous supply of each muscle when we are seeing deviation in particular gaze direction. Like in dextroversion, uh, we have actually spoken about all these things. The important thing here is a dextro elevation. So whenever we are dextro elevating, the right superior rectus and left inferior oblique will be the yoke muscle in that particular gaze of action. When you are talking about levo elevation, it becomes opposite of it, the left superior rectus, because in abduction, the superior rectus acts more. While in adduction, the inferior oblique has a levo elevation action or the elevation action in adduction of an inferior oblique is much more significant significant. So when we are talking about levo elevation or dextro elevation, the eye where the uh, position is happening, the same eye will have a recti muscle overacting and the contralateral eye, the inferior oblique or the opposite obliques will be overacting. I hope I'm clear here. Uh, so we'll just go for the uh, other uh, agonist, antagonist we have already discussed for the gazes. So uh, going ahead uh, with what all muscles are working in which gaze action. So if we are uh, seeing about the abduction, the lateral rectus uh, muscle is functioning. Uh, that is a primary action of the lateral rectus, that is abduction. If you talk about medial rectus, the primary action is the adduction, that is adduction. So uh, these are the only two recti which don't have a secondary and tertiary actions. If we talk about, uh, uh, say, inferior rectus or depression, so uh, the depression effects become maximum in abduction when it is inferior rectus is acting. If you come in the adduction, here the superior oblique will be acting more. So uh, the primary action of the inferior rectus we say as a depression, the secondary action is excycloduction. So when the eyes are abducted uh, or adducted to 23 degrees in position, that time the inferior rectus also acts as a, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, excyclo, uh, excyclototor. And the tertiary action of this muscle is abduction also. So, um, sorry, adduction also. So the recti are adductors, obliques are abductors that you can remember as a mnemonic. So B for B, obliques are abductors, recti are adductors. So lateral and medial don't have a prime, a secondary and tertiary action. The inferior rectus act, has a primary action of depression, secondary action as excyclotorsion, which happens in uh, 23 degree of adduction. And it can happen as adductor when it is completely depressed to 23 degrees abducted position. So that time it can act as an adductor also. So if we talk about the superior rectus, superior again, superior rectus are adductor also. Uh, the primary action is elevation. Uh, if the eyes... What happened? Am I audible? Yeah, ma'am, you're audible. Okay. So if the eyes are, again, 23 degrees abducted, it can act as an encyclototor also. Uh, inferior oblique, if we talk about the primary action is excyclotorsion or excycloduction. Um, the secondary action is elevation. That elevation happens when the eyes are adducted to 51 degrees. But uh, we can't adapt the eye to such a level. So even for 23 degrees also, it may act as or it acts as an adductor also. Uh, sorry, elevator also. And uh, the tertiary action is uh, elevation uh, of these muscles. I'm so sorry. Tertiary action is abduction. So if we uh, come, uh, come down to superior oblique muscle, the primary action is in cyclotorsion. Uh, when the eyes are adducted in 51 degrees, it acts as an encyclototor. The 
pure encyclotator if it is uh, again uh, if it is abducted to particular position uh, it can work as a abductor also if it is uh, uh, if it is uh, in the lateral gaze it might act as a abductor also but this action is a very very less action when we are talking about all the muscles and uh, when it is abducted uh, to uh, 23 degrees it can act as a depressor i hope i am clear here should we go forward yes ma'am please go ahead okay so uh, when we talk about the cardinal uh, positions of the eyes uh, as we have already discussed the primary position secondary positions are uh, dextroversion levoversion sarsum elevation and duo sarsum uh, versions tertiary positions are the levoversion uh, levo elevation dextro elevation levo depression and dextro depression are the tertiary positions of the eye so we have already discussed which are muscles will be acting in those particular gaze of directions so now coming to uh, the mechanism of how the eye actually uh, moves so whenever uh, we talk about the movement of the eyes actually uh, the muscles the uh, origin is at the circle of zin the muscles are actually orbital in aspects but when they come closer in the anterior orbit or maybe the mid orbit they change their path towards the globe and the point of contact of the muscle to the globe is called as a tangential point and from here the muscle gets insertion uh, at a particular point based on the uh, spiralotilogs uh, uh, the muscles are attached at the position where they are supposed to be the distance between the tangential point and the insertion of the muscle is called as arc of contact so every muscle whenever it is acting it acts in a particular plane it is called as a muscle plane so if we talk about the horizontal recti it moves around the vertical axis that is called as a y axis so we have particular three axis when we talk about the movement of the eyes that is a x axis y axis that is a fixed axis and a z axis so uh, the x axis helps in moving the eye vertically the y axis where the horizontal that is a reduction and uh, a deduction happens and the z axis where the uh, cyclo rotations happens uh, in cyclo and cyclo rotations are happening so these muscle planes are very important because the uh, tangent formed and the all the terminologies of laws which we are speaking about works on these muscle planes of that particular muscle and the vector is drawn uh, from the arc of contact to the tangential point when the muscle is contracting it gives you a particular direction of eye rotation so if the medial rectus is contracting the eye moves towards nose because that shortens the arc of contacts and globe moves the globes towards the uh, nasal side uh, when we come across these terminologies called as muscle plane so the now uh, orbit uh, yes so whenever we are actually talking about the movement of the globe in the orbit we talk about a particular axis so this uh, x axis y axis and z axis actually crosses in the center of rotation so this actually is a plane it is not a particular point so this plane is called as equatorial plane where all the axes arrange themselves in a particular position where the line of sight is coinciding with the fovea to make the clear vision so uh, when these things are happening actually they say that uh, the center of rotation lies 15 mm beyond the apical uh, area of the cornea so it actually falls slightly behind the equator of the globe and uh, this is how uh, the eyes will actually move so when the laws were kept or uh, when uh, actually helmholtz and uh, uh, burians uh, duons they started looking at the movement of the globe uh, they discussed about the particular axis where the movements are happening and uh, when uh, multiple theories were kept they came to an conclusion especially the fundamental laws of ocular motility was first placed by donders and he stated that whenever the eyes are moving in one particular position the whole the system that x y z axis move in such a way that the um, axis formed that muscle plane formed will be moved in such a way that it keeps the eye of the side of the center 
or site of rotation at the fovea so all the three dimensions will move in same particular position but when he was talking about or giving these examples he stated that these are all neural uh, mechanisms and not a mechanical mechanism uh, where eye is rotated in a particular direction so if you see this diagram uh, so basically these are three planes which are moving so he stated that the line of the sight always fall on the rotation of the eye so if we don't have this particular uh, rotation side he stated that there will be infinite movements of the eyes and the vision will not be clear so he gave an uh, hypothesis saying that the line of sight is the main important area to keep the vision clear in particular gaze direction so if you are seeing binocularly also these two lines should fall on the fovea and should make a similar movement uh, whenever we are having a change in gaze position while uh, this theory was uh, slightly uh, uh, unaccepted because of the cyclo rotations so whenever we are moving the eye uh, the theory that the line of the sight may not fall in the same area because it is not a plane so listings came with the idea that this is not a one line but it is a plane where all the three meridian which we discussed now that is x plane y plane and z plane are forming a uh, alpha angle that is a sine 8 uh, 8 degrees angle to x and z axis so this whole plane is making the eye movements very easy to keep the binocularity intact between the change in the gaze position so uh, to make this easy they have actually given this torque of action so if you see this whenever there is a horizontal movement acting uh, the torque is in the center but whenever you are trying to move the globes which was not explained by the donders theory it stated that the cyclo rotations also can happen in the same plane to keep the uh, uh, meridians in the same plane that is in the common plane so this gives an idea that why the motility is happening binocularly and conjugate and keeping the lines of the sight or having the binocular clear vision in all gazes of the position. So uh, just moving on to the further uh, laws of innovation. So there are another two laws which are discussed that is a laws of uh, Herring's law of equal innovation. So this law is also called as a law of motor correspondence. So what happens here is whenever we are trying to move the eyes in a particular direction, say you are having a conjugate movement and you want to move the eyes towards left. In that situation, the equal simultaneous supply will be provided to the left eye lateral rectus and the right eye medial rectus to move the eye simultaneously. So this supply is equal and simultaneous to have the pursuit movement very easy without causing any diplopia or recorrection saccades without overshooting. So this, this is a law of um, equal innovation. So why this law is very important for us is when we talk about the paralytic or restrictive strabismus. So whenever we have a muscle, a particular muscle paralysis, say the patient is having now left lateral rectus palsy here and the patient is trying to see the target in this position, that is a levo virgin position. So now the left lateral rectus is not moving. It is getting extra innervation to the medial rectus to get the eye in this particular position. So now we are getting, there is incompetence. Okay, so this is what states us that the primary and secondary deviation, whenever they are changed or different uh, with limitation of motility, uh, Herring's law of equal innervation helps us to understand the basic pathology that which muscle can be involved in that particular uh, uh, pathology. So the same applies when we are talking about the superior oblique palsy also. So whenever the patient is having a any particular gaze palsy, the agonist of the other eye basically or a synergistic muscle gets an equal innervation that is extra innervation to keep the eyes in that particular gaze of action to have a single binocular vision or have a clear vision. And this is how uh, the Herring's law of equal vision innervation comes into a clinical aspect or applied aspects in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, the next law, or uh, there is one more law which was actually uh, Herring's law 
again states uh, for the disconjugate movements also so herring state uh, stated that uh, this is a neural mechanism when the eyes are moving in one particular direction this is not the mechanical factors which are happening he stated that there are some um, areas in the brain which are firing when we are trying to see in particular direction but these movements are simultaneous and equal and when he uh, actually tried to es explain about the convergence movements he stated that whenever there is a convergence movement there will be equal and simultaneous supply to the both medial recti and there will be inhibitional uh, supply to both lateral recti to have both the eyes converging to a particular position to have a clear vision again in his theory he explained about the asymmetric equal innervation also so in asymmetric convergence so uh, say that an object is there of interest uh, at a angle which is very close to one eye and away from the other eye in that situation if we are getting the simultaneous supply we may not have a binocular single vision but herring stated that it can happen in cases of convergence that there will be asymmetric supply to the conjugating uh, converging muscles so if you want to see a object of interest at p which is causing more angle for uh, area of interest of the right eye and less of convergence in the left eye in that situation you get extra uh, innervation to the right medial rectus and extra uh, less innervation to the left medial rectus to keep the eyes aligned for convergence also this theory uh, was slightly unexplained uh, uh, because uh, he stated in his um, definitions of or uh, the hypothesis of giving the laws of uh, equal innervation in virgins but he was not able to explain the same theories for asymmetric convergence in this way helmholtz uh, helmholtz stated that there can be one possibility that whenever the eyes are converging for one particular direction Uh, this is a uniocular phenomena and he stated that it happens because of the stretch reflex of the muscle so whenever the object is coming in one particular area the stretch receptors or stretch receptors or proprioceptive receptors present in the medial rectus of one eye will get extra innervation to move the eyes more and lesser innervation to the eyes which need to be moved lesser and uh, this was a hypothesis given by helmholtz actually both the hypothesis uh, when we i went to the literature has uh, plus and minuses but actually both the hypothesis explains that there is a symmetrical convergence also can happen to keep the binocularity intact or have a single vision so whenever we are converging again there is a reflex of uh, uh, synkinesis reflex so there will be medial rectus uh, which is co uh, contracting uh pupils will be constricted because the retinal blur and depth of perception will increase uh, and there'll be a, a curvature of the ch change in the curvature of the lens also to keep the eyes uh, the retinal images which are anterior to us uh, very clear when we are seeing especially in converging so now uh, coming to the sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation that is a uh, inhibitional uh, law so this law states that their agonist muscle is getting regularly influenced whenever there is a movement in one particular direction but uh, say uh, with the example if the eye is moving in levo version so the left lateral rectus and the right medial rectus will get equal innervation but simultaneously the left medial rectus and the right lateral rectus will get an inhibitional uh um, innervation or reciprocal innervation to have have these movements very smooth without any jerkiness and um, without any jerkiness so the same applies when it is happening in the convergence as we discussed so whenever there is a paralysis of any particular muscle like we discussed uh, about the lateral rectus palsy Uh, the antagonist muscle will again get an extra supply because there is no inhibitional supply uh, to the medial rectus that time and it overact so whenever there is a left lateral rectus palsy you will have a large esotropia in those uh, uh, particular eyes so uh, coming uh, coming to the uh, supply of uh, 
uh, the muscles when we are cyclotorting also. So if the patient is turning his head towards the left shoulder, what happens is left superior oblique and left superior rectus will get extra innervation to keep the eye in cyclotorted and the right uh, inferior oblique and right inferior rectus will get extra in uh, extra um, innovation to keep the eye excyclotorted and the antagonist of these muscles will actually get an inhibitional supply to keep the eyes in that particular direction uh, uh, to have a binocularity so coming to the types of eye movements uh, so whenever we talk about eye movements each eye movement serves a very unique function and uh, it has its own properties particularly suited for that particular function. So what are these eye movements? Um, basically, they are five eye movements. Those are gaze shifting saccades, virgins movements, smooth gaze holding uh, movements, vestibular ocular reflex and optokinetic reflex. So when we are talking about uh, this, uh, especially the eye movements, we should know about the innervation of these pathways. So whenever we talk, the innovation is actually these movements are supranuclear movements. And uh, whenever we have uh, changes in the gaze of position, what we discussed now, we talk about the smooth pertuate pathways, convergence pathways and gaze holding pathways, which play a very important, the medial um, uh, longitudinal fasciculus plays a very important role in having these uh, gaze movements whenever the eyes are shifting their gaze while the saccadic movements vestibular ocular reflex optokinetic reflex as well as convergent gaze holding uh, for the eye movement will happen from a, a, supi, uh, a twitch muscle fibers which are present uh, in the motor neurons so coming to saccades so saccades are basically a rapid rotation of the eye to bring the images on the fovea. Say that uh, you want to change your uh, uh, gaze from one particular position and I want to see an object in my periphery. I would like to change now to have a refixation movement to go and see those movements, uh, the object of interest clearly. In that case, we have rapid rotation of eyes to bring the images on the fovea. So these are spontaneous and will happen whenever the object of interest in appearing suddenly in your area of interest. These are actually voluntary movements and can be reflexive movements also. So what are the neural controls of uh, this uh, uh, saccadic uh, movements? So the saccades can be vertical and horizontal saccades. So when we talk about horizontal saccades, actually uh, the eyes will take a refixation movement and the horizontal saccade will uh, have uh, orientation or the fibers are located at the uh, paramedian um, pontine reticular formation, which is next to the abducens nerve. In this situation, what happens is the supply will be given to the abducens nucleus and ocular motor nucleus simultaneously to move the eye uh, rapidly in one particular direction. So saccades are actually very fast movements. Uh, we can have saccades up to 300 degrees, uh, degrees in per milliseconds. These are burst, uh, burst neurons, which makes the eye move faster. Uh, along with that, uh, it has again a supply to a uh, little bit towards the vestibular nuclei also. So whenever we are having the right rotations with change in saccades, uh, the vestibular nuclei will also come into picture to keep the eyes and have the saccades very smooth. So whenever we have a lesion in this particular area, the patient will not be able to generate the saccades, especially uh, we, when we discuss these kind of things, when there is a progressive supranuclear palsy or when the patient is having pontine lesions or tumors, the patient will not be able to generate the saccades in this particular direction, like horizontal saccades. So how do you check saccades for any... Uh, in the clinics, you ask the patient to change the gaze in 30 degree apart uh, uh, eyes and ask the patient to change their gaze from one, uh, one target to the other target very fast. So if the patient is able to generate saccades and have the uh, uh, fixation at the same target, that means that the saccades, uh, rug saccades are good. They have a good refixation moment 
and uh, even the generation of the saccades are good if we talk about the vertical gate center or vertical saccades again the center is a rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus which comes very close at the superior colliculus inferior aspect or the rostral aspect of that and uh, in this case maximum supply will be given to the ocular motor uh, nuclei it doesn't come to the fourth nerve also uh, or it does come to the fourth uh, fourth nerve nuclei also and maintains the vertical gate centers or vertical saccades so whenever we have any abnormality of saccade generation uh, the patient will have turning of the head to see the objects clearly along with that they will have difficulty in shifting the gaze uh that's how clinically it is important when we are checking the saccades uh, or any abnormal eye movements we need to check about generation of the saccades if the patient is having restrictive movements or like in thyroid eye disease the saccades will be hypometric but they will have a slight floating floating phenomena also whenever they are going close to the target they will have a lesser innervation to reach that center and then we call it as a hypometric saccade when we have a nerve pulses also whenever we are checking the saccade the supply is coming simultaneously to both the muscles but the saccades will be floating because the innervation will be given in burst phases so you get a floating saccades whenever we are talking about uh, the nerve pulses and associated saccade generation in that particular gaze of action um again the saccades uh, are important in cases of internuclear ophthalmoplegia also whenever we try to check that you get a floating saccades in cases of IN, uh, ino also so moving on to uh, the second type of eye movements those are vergens so vergens are important because they help us to enlarge the field and bring the object of attention on to the fovea vergens can be voluntary or involuntary uh basically voluntary ones are the optical ones whenever we turn the head or uh, the head or the body changing the acoustic movements will generate the vergence movements and other stimuli like uh, if you are having um, any retinal slip or uh, uh, whenever there is a drifting movements also the vergence will happen to keep the uh, attention of the object on the fovea so when we talk about vergence we talk about dextroversion levoversion when we talk about vertical and oblique there are two depressors and two elevators which help us to do the vergences that is sarsum uh, sarsum version and do sarsum version and when we talk about the uh, cyclo version that is oculoceptalic reflex so whenever we have a supranuclear gaze pulses or a very young child coming in your opd we do dolls eye phenomena so in dolls eye what we try to see is we try to check the oculocephalic reflex so you turn the head with this stimuli if the child is fixing on particular gaze the vergence movement will generate and this is how it helps the patient to rule out that there is intactness of the superior nucleus uh, again it uh, helps us to uh, get a motility idea especially in cases of very young children so uh, cycloversions are uh, also called as oculocephalic reflex or dolls eye phenomena uh, coming to pursuits so whenever we talk about pursuit movements this involve fixation of an object and then jumping to the next object of interest so it is a slow tracking movement especially if you have uh, you are reading a book or you are traveling in a train and looking at the looking at the scene which are outside there is a smooth pursuit and then refixation saccade movement which is happening most of the time the pursuits are voluntary movements to track the stimulus pursuit cannot be executed in the absence of some environmental stimulus and the trigger for pursuit is to maintain the difference of velocity between the eyes and the target which is moving so the pursuits are actually slow movements which happens uh, uh, like in uh, if you take the movements which are happening for the saccade are happening uh, in fraction of seconds like in less than 30 milliseconds you will have multiple refixation movements while saccades are very slow they long up to 150 to 200 milliseconds also to keep the eyes uh, on the object of interest which follows slowly in your uh, vision 
so what are the neural controls of pursuits so if you talk about the neural con uh, controls of uh, pursuits it starts from the striate cortex it goes to the um, medial longitudinal uh, fasciculus and the uh, uh, actually forgot about this term now so it goes to the pontine nuclei followed by cerebellum and then to the pprf and uh, these whole area need to be in, intact to have a pursuit movements to be um, i would like to say smooth so then only uh, you will move the target which are happening in your field of vision clearly uh, when you have these all centers intact so whenever there is a lesion in this uh, areas you will have a pursuit abnormalities or supranuclear abnormalities so virgins movements are actually the disconjugate movements uh, which helps the eyes to move in opposite direction like convergence and divergence which we actually discussed earlier so i don't want to go in detail about this now uh, so what are the virgins movement so whenever there is a heterophoria so what is heterophoria there is a slow drifting movement of the eyes whenever the attention is not there in this situation also you get a disconjugate movement to keep the eyes uh, at the same particular position and uh, this is how the heterophoria like if you try to keep a prism which are based in in front of both eyes the eye will diverge and these movements are disconjugate movements in both the eyes so the simultaneously if you are keeping um, base out prism in front of both eyes there will be simultaneous inward movement of the eye so that is how uh, we actually check the virgins uh, which can be elicited if you are not able to elicit the virgin you can actually use prisms to check for the virgins movement in this particular patient so whenever we talk about virgins we should also know about the fusional amplitudes so um, whenever we talk about uh, uh, fusional amplitudes this is the area or the amplitude of the eyes to keep the eyes in one particular direction even if uh, i would say the uh, if there is a heterophoria like uh, the patient is having uh, 10 prism diopter of eso or exophoria the patients will have 15 15 degrees of reserve to keep the eye convergence the divergence amplitudes are actually larger and vertical amplitudes are even smaller as compared uh, with the horizontal uh, deviations cyclo uh, torsions are actually or the amplitudes are only 3 degrees 3 to 5 degrees which happens in oblique palsy so sometimes if the patient is having superior oblique palsy congenital onset they have a fusional amplitudes up to 5 degrees if it is a bilateral one they will have a fusional amplitudes up to 10 to 15 degrees so this is how uh, this fusional amplitudes will help us in diagnosing uh, the patients as well as helping the patient to avoid post operative diplopia as well so whenever you are planning a surgery you actually check for the fusional amplitudes so orthoptics evaluation is very very important so um, when we are talking about uh, uh, a patient with exotropia, intermittent exotropia of 30 prism diopters, and you are checking now uh, how much is the angle which you are going to operate. In this situation, the haploscope or a major haploscope will give you the amplitude of virgins, convergence as well as divergence and the breakout and break-in points. In this situation, you can actually plan for the maximum target to get the best results. Along with that, the fusional amplitudes also play a very important part in cases of prism adaptation test. So sometimes we come across uh, eating of prisms, especially the patient is having isotropia, which was uh, young onset, and you are trying to do a prism adaptation test now. First, the patient will fuse for 30, but if you give the 30 prism diopters for a longer time, they might go up to 40, 45, 50. So these are all the fusional amplitudes which were reserved for that patient. And if you give more and more prism, the, the, actually the eyes will relax and there will be eating of the prism. So um, virgins movements or um, fusional amplitudes are very, very important when you are having a surgical intervention in patients where there is an intermittent deviation or very long standing uh, deviation. Uh, coming to uh, vestibular ocular reflex. So whenever uh, we are talking about vestibular ocular reflex, we, the important thing is to talk about 
this apparatus so this is actually a labyrinthine apparatus where we have a three semicircular canals which are oriented to each other perpendicularly and there is a labyrinthine apparatus in the center which actually has endolymph inside so if you look at one semicircular canal it has a ampulla it has a cupula and it has an endolymph so there is an endolymph which is actually moving depending on the position of the head and this fluid actually changes its um, direction and causes the changes in the pressure on the cupula which actually moves the eye in one particular direction because the cupula comes very close to the oculomotor nuclei so coming to what happens actually when you are turning the head so whenever you are turning head in one particular direction say you are uh, turning head towards left there will be deaccelerating force on uh, the on the inhibitional supply will be given to one particular aspect and the excitatory supply will be given to the opposite muscles or uh, to have the gaze position without any nystagmus or without any diplopia and uh, this is how the eyes will turn so what happens actually so whenever there is a head turning to one particular direction there will be supply given to the ocular motor nuclei and in this position there will be actually a uh, supply to the abducens muscle as well as all ocular motor nucleus in that way whenever the head is turning the uh, reflex goes from the medial longitudinal fasciculus to the ocular motor nuclei as well as to the vestibulo ocular apparatus so when all the things are intact in this situation only actually the eyes will rotate opposite direction like uh, we discussed in a uh, previous uh, picture if the head is turning towards left side the left superior oblique left uh, superior rectus will get a maximum innervation while vice versa will happen for the contralateral eye to keep the eyes in the uh, particular gaze why it is important so whenever we are turning the head or having a changes in our head position we should not have diplopia and imbalance to maintain the body in uh, and head position with the ocular movements having a steady vision the vestibular ocular reflex uh, plays a very important role so uh, coming to optokinetic nystagmus or optokinetic reflex this uh, this is this is a very important reflex which helps us to get an idea about the region also so in this what we actually do is whenever uh, okay and drum which has a white and black stripes of different width will be rotated from one particular direction so if the patient is having a fixation on one stripe if it is rotated there will be a smooth pursuit and a refixation saccade movement that happens because the world sleeps in a large portion of the retina and produces a sense of self motion and it gives a saccadic reflex to keep the eyes again at the area of interest so this is called as optokinetic reflex uh, reflex or optokinetic nystagmus this is very important because these are the reflexes like vestibulo ocular reflex or optokinetic reflex or vergence reflexes these are actually forming at a very younger age so any abnormality in the vision can hamper the optokinetic uh, reflex or a vestibulo ocular reflex also uh, when we talk about optokinetic reflex uh, again it is very important for us in cases where there is a malingering or poor vision to get an idea that how much could be the possible visual acuity because these are very easy to elicit and uh, these are actually uh, the patient cannot uh, suppress the optokinetic reflex if he has a good vision so coming to the last part of the presentation that is the fixation and field of fixation the fixation can be monocular or, or binocular fixation so when we talk about monocular fixation again we talk about the terms of ductions so whenever the change in the position of the area of interest of the object moves the one eye also can move to have the particular fixation gaze so when we talk about the monocular fixation or monocular field of fixation there are various degrees which are available uh, to us and when we talk about the binocular fixation we talk about the area where the area of interest is seen in 3d perception also so uh, kestenbaum has actually given a definition of what is a good fixation so uh, there there should be a good foveal function 
the object to be fixated should have a distinct contour in a home they should not have a homogeneous area the object need to be fixated should have a attention value and the sense of directness of the vision associated with foveal but not the peripheral retinal stimulation because whenever we have a binocular vision we have a retinal corresponding images even if we don't have a foveal fixation even with the peripheral retinal stimulation also we can have a binocular field of vision so uh, whenever we talk about uh, panam's area of fusion uh, these are the field of fixation where without rotating your head and eyes we are able to see certain area in the 3d perception also that uh, with the color as well as the contour perception that is a field of fixation so what is actually uh, the amplitude of field of fixation whenever you turn your head to see particular area that increases again your uh, field of fixation or increases the uh, area of fixation of interest uh, when we talk about field of fixation we talk when the head and the eyes are steady uh, that is a particular area where we have a, a mono a binocular fixation so whenever we have a fixation movement one particular uh, area we have three terms called as tremors drift and micro saccades so these are the movements which are actually happening throughout our uh, um, a change in the gaze position or even when the eyes are steady or gaze holding also these micro movements will happen so these are all physiological eye movements which are happening so tremors are actually less than half hour of second or half hour of minute which happens every 1 to 2 seconds and these are very small saccadic movements which are happening to keep the eye on the area of interest when there is a inhibitional supply to the contralateral or antagonist muscle drifts are are the micro drifts usually are a slow movements which are happening uh, in 1 to 3 degrees and they have a one a half hour contact hour to keep the eyes uh, whenever there is a change in field of fixation in that cases we have a slight drifting movements that is micro drift and again there will be micro saccade to keep the eyes at a area of interest so these are physiological eye movements which are happening uh, when we are having a gaze holding uh, on one particular object so coming to uh, uh, i think i have covered this so these are the actually terms or the area of binocular field of fixation so whenever we talk about uh, monocular and binocular field so if you see this dotted line which we are seeing is actually the area of monocular field of the right eye and uh, the solid line is the area of um, um field of vision of the left eye so whenever we talk about binocularity actually uh, this is the field of fixation for us uh, when there is a binocular perception but the amplitude of field of fixation is this area where you are actually know that there are some objects but you are not able to actually identify the contour and the color and the shape of areas or the objects which are lying in this particular field um so what are these degrees of fusion which we have so whenever there is a monocular fixation actually we have elevation of uh, maybe 41 degrees depression of of 45 degrees adduction is a uh, maximum field of vision that is a 48 degrees and abduction is slightly lesser so and binocular field of vision again um, happens uh, uh, to 28 degrees for both eyes so basically this binocular field of fixation is slightly contracted when we want to see the objects of interest in 3d perception to get a good color contrast and contour of the field of objects in your field of fixation uh, so binocular field of fixation will be slightly narrowed as compared to the monocular field of fixation uh, that's all i had uh, thank you i would like to take any questions or please any suggestions Yeah, about thank you, ma'am, for uh, simplified explanation of uh, such a complex topic. I would uh, also like to thank all the chairs for giving their valuable time. I'm going because we don't have much time left. I'm going to put a few questions uh, out of this. Why do you check superior oblique action in adduction when the tertiary action is abduction? So uh, these actions are actually are happening in. uh 
in a larger extent like 51 degrees of adduction and 56 degrees of abduction so these are tertiary actions actually these actions are not happening regularly we don't see them so whenever uh, uh, like in old uh, uh, i would like to say um, so so i would like to say here that uh, whenever you cut off medial rectus and lateral rectus and ask the patient to move the eyes in one particular direction they found that even irrespective of not having medial and lateral rectus also the eye could adduct and in that situation uh, they came to an action that there is a superior oblique as well as uh, so superior oblique is actually uh, abductor not adductor and uh, the action happens when the eyes are in extreme abducted position that time only you will see so usually you don't go to 56 degrees of abduction and 51 degrees of adduction so usually you are not going to see this pure movements of uh, superior oblique or inferior oblique in your day to day practice these all things are uh, actually stated because of the muscle plane or the tangent of that muscle which is happening in that particular direction uh that's all i could explain if uh, dr pradeep or dr rohit wants to add here something <laughs> yeah i can see the simple that when we are looking for the vertical action of any muscle the superior recti are going to be the uh, sole elevators when the eye is abducted 23 degrees from the primary position okay then the superior rectus becomes the primary elevator when the eye is abducted 53 degrees then it the superior oblique would be the sole depressor and the inferior oblique will become the sole elevator but in practice we cannot adapt the eye to 53 degrees so whatever uh, we can adapt that is about 30 or 40 degrees of adduction that time the superior and the inferior obliques are going to be having more of elevator and depressor action respectively the inferior oblique the elevator and the superior oblique the depressor action compared to the superior rectus and the inferior rectus which would lose their elevation uh, function which is best seen in abduction of 23 degrees okay so if we have to look for the superior oblique function we will look for depression in adduction and for the inferior oblique we will look for elevation in adduction this is nothing to do with their abductor function we are not looking for their abductor function in this position okay in fact the ones the eyes are adducted their abductor function is going to be reduced the abductor function of superior oblique and the inferior oblique is only going to be seen when the eye is in primary position okay and when it becomes more abducted then it will be much more so in fact the primary and secondary and tertiary actions of each muscle are going to be different in different gazes so i think that is the table is given in the books which is showing you uh i would suggest that rather than memorizing these things even the actions of muscles and all that one should have a visualization of the eye the eye muscles and different gazes in different gazes what is the orientation of that muscle and the eyeball and then you can actually see what is going to happen there was a very nice video which i used to actually show also from baylor college of medicine houston which is Uh, giving you a three dimensional video concept of the eye movements in different gazes if you happen to have uh, hold on that maybe you can or maybe next time when we have uh, somewhere together we will show you that but what you understand is visualize yourself what is happening of the eyeball the eye muscles then you will be able to understand so the obliques are elevators and depressors better in adduction compared to the recti vertical recti which are better elevators and depressors in abduction so we look for the uh, superior rectus action elevation in abduction and the inferior oblique in adduction for elevation so i think i hope this is uh, i mean there are pictures which are given and by the way i would say that uh, von newton's book is really very good but it will sometimes confuse you yeah and which the images in kansky sir are very good although kansky is a retinal surgeon uh, was but the quid chapter where it has demonstrated the muscle insertions are very good and that's where he has shown this that when you uh, adduct the eye then how the, it's the superior oblique's vertical action which takes prominence and you can actually use them uh, to compare the actions with res respect to the yoke muscle on the other eye 
So that's how you are picking up over or under action of a particular muscle. Because torsional actions cannot be compared unless you're looking at, at the fundus. So over action of the torsional action may not be easy to pick up unless you're doing fundus photographs. But easily when you're doing ocular motility, you can pick up vertical discrepancy of a superior oblique over action or an under action by its relative action compared to the yoke muscle. And that is best seen, vertical action is best seen in the adduction. And that's why I said Kansky has a very good set of diagrams if you can actually, uh, and they're easily accessible. I mean, everybody has Kansky. Yeah. So maybe you can go back to the pictorial ones or wherever you have, or maybe go back to the strabismus simplified for these things rather than more noodle for this. <laughs> Actually, the last uh, thing I did was opening your book, sir, because I have read my, my PG. So I was like, this is difficult. Now I have to read Pradeep Shanfa's book. Then I can finish it. I uh, started feeling it's, strabismus is not that awe-inspiring. So. <laughs> no, no, sir. I, I would disagree. Strabismus is actually inspiring. Uh, going to the next question. Uh, is abduction of a superior oblique responsible for A pattern? Say again. Uh, is abduction of superior oblique responsible for A pattern? Right. You, so that's correct. The superior oblique, as she described, has three actions. The depression, depression the intorsion, which is the primary action, and the abduction. So whenever the eyes are in down gaze, there the abductors are going to be the lateral rectus as well as superior oblique. So in down gaze, there's the superior oblique overaction. Uh, compared to the superior rectus, which is going to be an adductor. Now, between the superior rectus, uh, inferior rectus in the down gaze and the superior oblique in the down gaze, if the uh, superior oblique is overacting, obviously there would be an abduction because the inferior rectus is an adductor and superior oblique we have found is overacting. So, it will overcome the adduction of the inferior rectus and cause a, a divergence in down gaze. So, the A pattern or A exo is happening because of a Superior oblique overaction. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, do, uh, do anyone want to add this, Dr. Dohit or Dr. Ramitawa? You want to add anything to this question? I think good. I think it's an excellent. It was an excellent talk. Uh, I, I'm sure people would want to go back and look at it again because I had a lot of very valuable information. So I, I know it's available on YouTube. So people, uh, when they want to re, uh, you know, kind of revisit or relearn what they have heard, they should definitely go back to the. To this video and uh, you know follow especially the nerve connections for eye movement. I'm sorry to disappoint Dada, but uh, we are not yet done with the questions. We have so many questions. Uh, I'm going to put a three or four more questions. So the next question is especially for you from one of the audience. Uh, can you please explain uh, fixation duress? Does it apply to vertical recti as well in pseudotosis? So yes, fixation duress so fixation duress is essentially that uh, as uh, Dr. Sampada talked about it, the, the fixing eye is deciding the innervation. So when you limit the fixing eye, you are causing a duress or a stress on the fixation. So the innervation, central innervation will increase and that will cause an innervational increase in the yoke muscle also. So uh, let's suppose we want to talk about vertical muscle. So there is a superior rectus under action of one eye. If I do a Fardon procedure or a procedure that limits the action of the superior rectus of the other eye, which is, of course, we have to make sure that that is the fixing eye. If that is the fixing eye and the patient attempts to look up, we have iatrogenically prevented the eye from going up. The brain, because it wants to look up, will increase the central innervation and that will flow to the bo both the recti and the eye will go up. So our aim is to weaken the uh, up gaze movement of the normal eye to uh, that would be perfect of course to match the weakness of the paralyzed or the paretic or the underacting muscle. And in that case there will be an equal movement up because of increased central innervation. And yes if there is because this will bring the uh, affected eye into primary position or get it elevated, pseudotosis will get corrected. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So, uh, how to contract uh, eating of prisms in virgins measurements, especially vertical in superior oblique palsy? I hope you got the question. So. 
like uh, just dr sampada has explained is uh, the, there is an eating of prisms in virgins measurements in convergence so how do we contract that uh, contract that as in uh, we measure the maximum amount probably i guess or uh, contract that is in remove that in a sense it, you actually have to measure the entire va value that you are getting even after eating up the prism so suppose you start at 25 prisms and you uh, and the patient is controlled temporarily at 25 prisms and over time while he's uh, using the prisms the iso you will see gets increased which means eating up prisms now the patient requires much more a, a larger value of prisms than that was measured at the start of your measurement procedure so suppose you keep doing this and you find out that the patient is now 40 prisms so that is the amount of surgery you're going to actually plan for so that's that's what is called eating up of prisms that the patient starts off with a, a lower value because of the fusion uh, because of the fusional vergences uh, that are available and because you would once you are doing surgical intervention would want to do for the full value of the deviation and that is why you should do this prism adaptation test and get the actual value of the deviation uh, dr pradeep do you want to add something to this no that's what the prism adaptation see, finally came to that that the prism adaptation test is the basis of this that we are uh, going to give that prism and then see what happens so after some time we find that he has already overcome that and we have to add more prisms so uh, earlier i mean lot of studies have been done on the pat to know the uh, the reason why we have under corrections in exotropias so they were doing the prism adaptation test to see that they are fully correcting the ability to eat up the prism so that we get no under corrections uh, dr amitava what's your experience uh, in this aspect sir talking about the prism adaptation test yes sir. and eating up the prism okay uh, i'm not really doing that uh, regularly because uh, you know today if you having success without uh, doing that you don't tend to then you know do it uh, unless you have an academic interest so if you that's why you don't see too many papers now on the prism adaptation test so it there was a period when i saw a lot of papers and we also try to do these things but uh, you know most of us will fall back on two things which are you know straightforward and you get your happy outcomes and you stick to that can i add one point here yep. so we actually came across few patients where there is intermittent deviation of 40 prism diopters and you do surgery and there is a residual of 20 so actually a uh, few of my colleagues we decided to do intermittent exotropia and check a prism adaptation for at least half an hour or 45 minutes and it came to our surprise that few patients were actually okay with 35 prism even though your deviation is coming 40 45 they were actually fusing better with 35 and they were not deviating at all and few patients were were actually building up up to 60 but the difference of 40 and 60 was too much that uh, we were actually scared to operate for 60 and getting that 20 et back so uh, that time we uh, we were actually wondering if it is because of the divergence and convergence amplitudes are changing because they are not relaxing themselves or uh, some other phenomena which is causing so much uh, of change in the amplitude like having 60 and 30 and having 40 and 35 differences uh, too much whenever we give intermittent exotropia more and more relaxation or more and more patching you should get at least 10 prism diopter extra deviation not a lesser deviation after doing prism adaptation so that's what the only thing uh, i wanted to add about or maybe get some opinion if uh, why does that happen so actually it's more of an innervational problem as somebody very nicely said that uh, when we are doing strabismus surgery we have an orthopedic approach to a neurological problem so we are handling the muscles thinking that they are uh, going to be uh, doing a very uh, straight forward job but the problem lies in the brain so if there is a divergence uh, overtone then uh, that's why we see a residual exos in many of these conditions so there people have done one is prism adaptation test the second is patching for prolonged times to see if we can get the maximum uh, uh, exo deviation that we need to uh, operate upon thirdly people have done adjustable surgeries to see if after the surgery this can be done so there are different approaches but still yeah sometimes the uh, orthotropia eludes us in spite of all our efforts also in exo uh, a far distance measurement is also something that would be helpful because sometimes when we are measuring in you know closed rooms 
or even using the three meter chart at three meters. So at that time there is that constant because of now we know that uh, it's not just the foveal uh, binocularity but the peripheral binocularity that is also affecting alignment. So one of the things possibly could be that that is why we are under measuring. So one of the measures could be take the patient out or make them look out of the window and do the you know final measurements for the far distance. So, Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please go ahead. Sir. So I'm just going to take this opportunity and I would like to discuss a clinical scenario. There was a case of uh, uh, divergence excess in which the near deviation was almost 10 to 15 prisms less than the distant deviation in an IDS patient. So uh, I've gone ahead and done a bilateral LR recession. So she was ortho for the distance, but she's having almost 10 prisms of near, near esotropia and uh, she complains of diplopia. So I'm a little like, I want her like your help in this scenario. Yes. Although uh, 10 prisms is a very uh, borderline amount, so one usually does not, would not, I mean, it does not come under, uh, you know, uh, a, a kind of pattern in which you would actually uh, attempt to, but uh, one would either correct for the lower amount and then uh, because it's a divergent squint, you could expect or hope that, you know, fusional divergences may help in the post-op period. So that would be one of the ways to plan the other way to plan would be to plan for an intermediate amount so that your consecutive ESO for near may not be all that much and then again would be within the fusional range. So that would be one of the ways to doing when you have very small difference in the distance and near deviation. But otherwise, of course, you would think in terms of planning uh, for correction of the distance near deviation difference also. Do you, uh, do you counsel the patients about uh, having ET post-surgery and giving bifocals if it is completely not resolving? So, uh, because uh, we actually, uh, myself, if I am getting a pseudo-divergence, ex uh, true divergence excess squint, and if after plus three deviation, the distance and near is becoming normal, I have two, three, four patients where actually they had 20 PD ET post-operatively, but uh, six weeks it became uh, less than 10 intermittent esotropia. Uh, but in one patient, actually I had 25 prism diopter of ET at four months as well. So for that patient, I had to give bifocals because uh, we did surgery. Uh, the literature says that you do for maximum and then see most of the time if it is a true divergence excess, usually they don't need near glasses at all. It covers itself. But uh, I myself have this one case where there was a 25 ET even after four months. Uh, now, after giving plus three, actually the ET is reducing. It is coming to 12, 13. Uh, so now I'm tapering the plus not giving plus three, I'm, I'm coming to plus two at this point. Uh, so that's what, I mean, look, 10 is not worrisome, but 25 was worrisome for, worrisome for us. So any input? Is there an issue in your case, Sampada? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Pradeep? AC by A ratio. Uh, actually, yes, AC by A ratio was, uh, if I'm not wrong, it was six, six or seven, seven it was. It was high AC by A ratio. Higher side, yeah. That is the reason usually, I mean, uh, these cases turn out to have and then we have to give bifocals. So preoperatively, if we can measure the AC by A ratio, we may be uh, better prepared. And sometimes if the glasses bifocals are not going to be tolerated, then one can do posterior fixation or uh, farden on the medial recti later on to correct that. So how much time do we wait uh, to do the FEDEN in this patient, sir? Uh, depends on the age of the person also. I mean, if there is an ESO, which is in a very small child, it happens, then we have to at least give occlusion for the waiting period, right? So, and that in a month or two, it becomes all right. Otherwise, we may have to intervene something because the esotropia allowed in a younger child may not be uh, really desirable. And that's the reason why, I mean, uh, compared to what many people internationally talk about doing overcorrection even in the younger IDS, I wouldn't do that. Usually do an undercorrection in an intermittent exotropia in a child so that we do not have an esotropia, especially in our, uh, we may not have a very good follow-up and we don't want to leave them eso. Yes, yes. Thank you. So I would um, hereby concluding this session, uh, 
uh, I personally had a wonderful time in this session because uh, uh, having a great speaker and uh, thank you Dr. Pradeep Sharma and Dr. Rohit Saxena and Dr. Amitava for your valuable time. And we will be meeting uh, next on July 8th. And uh, that is the most important, one of the most important sessions, Examination of Squint Part 1 by Nanadanda and Ramesh Kekunya. So uh, hoping to look forward. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. Thank you, Dr. Sambada. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you, Sudha. Thank you, Dr. Sambada. 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 Thank you, Dr. S